What is up heroes, this is Minite Zero, and welcome back to Let's Play Professor Layton in the Curious Village Blind. In the last episode, we struggled with a couple of the puzzles. I'm not gonna lie, we definitely struggled. However, I do have some good news to start off this episode. I think, I believe, I have the answer to what's hidden. I actually spent some time, uh, my family and I, my family, well, as a whole, we went skiing recently, and in the car ride, I was looking at this picture the whole time. <laughs> so, I actually think I have... An answer. Um, I thought, and actually what my thought process was, what it eventually ended up being, was thinking of five letter animals. I came up with tiger, uh, goose, moose, uh, rhino, hippo, <laughs> a variety of things. But one, one thing, and then after I would do that, I would try to look at different areas for those specific animals. Um, I even thought human or fairy, maybe getting a little bit tricky with the wording. But one that I think is the answer is horse. And if you rotate this picture 90 degrees counterclockwise, the the head of the horse is sort of emerging from the side here. The frog itself, actually, is the, the horse. And so, if you turn your head to the side, you can see that the eye of the frog, this is a nostril. Here would be the other nostril. Here is the eye of the horse, and then there are the two ears here. I will say that I don't like that it's only the, the head of the horse. I wish that if the answer were a horse, it would be the entirety of the horse. Or, similarly, it, that the context of the rest of the picture around the horse would make sense. And maybe there's some other way to view the scenery once it's rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise, but... Um, but I think that's going to be our answer, guys. So, we'll give that a shot and hope for the best. Let's hope this is right. If this isn't it, I don't know, guys. Because <laughs> this is something I actually saw. Wow, that is it. I did it! Yes! That's right, rotate the picture to the left and all of a sudden you're staring at a horse. I knew the... Well, I knew the frog looked odd, but it's so difficult to say, well, maybe it's not something in the weeds or the grass or in the negative space or whatever it may be. Still haven't figured out a fearsome foe, so don't really have anything for that one. Image equation, hadn't thought about that one, just focused on that picture one. So we'll move on to find the volume and continue with the rest of the puzzles, and we'll see if we can come back to those and come up with anything, but... Huh. A strangely shaped container sits before you. All sides of the shape, save for depth, are of equal length. Okay. All four points, A, B, C, and D, are located in the center of their respective sides. Additionally, line A, D, line B, C, and the depth of the container are all one foot. Okay. What is the total volume of the figure in cubic feet? Don't worry about the thickness of the walls of the vessels. So, this is pretty weird, because they go from one midpoint of a side to another midpoint. So I guess one way to look at this is we can, you know, split up into a bunch of rectangular prisms, right? And, and work from there. Although, ultimately, if we know the length of one side, we'll be able to figure this whole thing out. So, my thought process is, how can we figure out one, one side length? And... To be honest... Because everything is in terms of side lengths, we, we can actually take advantage of the length of AD and BC being one to create some convenient triangles. So let's let's do this. I'm gonna draw this line here and then this line here, and then we've got this nice triangle with AD as the hypotenuse, which has a length of one. What is the length of this um, this horizontal side, this horizontal leg here? It's going to be three X, where X represents one side length, right? So we'll say that that's three X. And then, what about our other side? Well, given that D is the midpoint of one side, and so is A, and our line is, well, not drawn to scale, but horizontally, directly across, um, this should be X over 2, and then an X, and then an X over 2. So I think we have 2X. And so, we can use the Pythagorean Theorem, then, to say that 2X 
squared plus 3x squared is equal to 1. And when we do the math, we'll get 4x squared plus 9x squared, which is 13x squared is equal to 1. So x squared is equal to 1 over 13. So um, x is equal to 1 over the square root of 13, I guess. Which seems like a really odd number to have as the side length. But we'll, we'll go with it for now. Because we're probably going to be squaring this anyways. So if each side length is 1 over square root of 13, and we're doing length times width times depth, right, to get the volume of each of these shapes, our top row is going to be a volume of 1 over 13. Right? So that's going to have 1 over 13. And in fact, this, this shape, right, this rectangular prism is actually repeated in all the other layers of the shape. So this middle, or this, you know, second row is actually just going to be 3 of the top row. So that's going to be 3 over 13. And then the middle one is going to be 5 over 13. And then 3 over 13, and then 1 over 13. And conveniently enough, that's going to equal 13 over 13, or 1. So the volume, interestingly enough, will just be 1 cubic foot. Yeah, I, I feel pretty good about that one. That's pretty odd though. Because what's interesting is when the side lengths were 1 over square root of 13, I was like, am I on the right track? I don't think that they would want me to think up something like that, but... Maybe there's an easier way to do it. Good work. As shown above, the odd shape you were given can be reconfigured into a cube with a volume of 1 cubic foot. <laughs> so there's the easier way to do it, guys. <laughs> is you just reconfigure the whole thing into a cube itself. Pretty clever. I, did def I definitely did not see that. But you guys know me and are probably not surprised that I've heard, I, of course, first jumped to algebra. Anyways, the knight's escape. What do we have here? Is it going to be another one of those escape puzzles? With the, the ball and the blocks? Aw, oh, no it's not. Darn. Those were tough, but really fun. Behold the brave knight as he fights his way through a dark and winding maze. With his strength waning, the knight decides that he must exit the maze by opening the fewest number of doors possible. Find the path that allows the knight to escape from the, those dark catacombs while opening as few doors as possible. Okay, so start and goal. Um, I'm tempted to see if there are, there are comparable routes, right? So for example, if I were to go, can I draw? What? They're not going to let me draw on the one that has a maze, essentially? <laughs> That's not helpful. Um, well, you'll notice that there are these big loops, right? So if I go to the left here, I pretty much have to go to a, through one of the doors in order to get a, a meaningful path. Um, is it worthwhile to get the treasure chests or anything like that? No, I guess not. They're just there for, for the fun of it. All right, well, let's see what we can do then. Let's work backwards from the goal, I think. That might... Actually, no, we're, we're going to have to test a variety of pathways anyways. So what I'll do is... Oh, man, I really wish I could draw. Just to the left, between that green thing and the X, there's a door. That's going to be a pretty pivotal door. So we're going to try the path above that, to the left of that door, um, first. So we'll go through one door, and then we'll follow to the left and we'll encounter another door we have to go through, and then we have a branching point. We can either go down or further to the left. If we go down, what happens? So if we go down there, notably, and we don't go through that door, so we pass the skull thing, we pass the dragon, we go around under, we essentially end up back at starting points that we could have gotten to with fewer doors. So that is definitely not the route. Um, so what happens if we go through that door then to the right? Then we end up going through another door and end up again back at a starting route. So that's not the pathway. So we're gonna back up again to the, uh, the blue gate just to the right of the blue chest. And instead we're gonna go to the left. We'll pass the dragon again. We'll get to another branching point. If we go to the right, 
we can go through one door, go past the treasure chest, go through another door, go through another door and end up at the goal. So that would be what? One, two, three, four, five. Five, okay, so we'll note that. What happens if I go down through this door though? Notably, I can take that long swiggly path on the left and end up at another door just before the goal. If I were to do that, that would be one, two, three, four. Four doors. So that's currently, um, oh, <laughs> I can't draw, but I can click. So that'll make life easier. Um, so let's, let's go through the five door path that I was just talking about. I'm kind of starting here, then going here. If I were to go then along here and here and here, that would be a five door path but that's not gonna be as effective as our four door path, which would be this one. So now the, the thing is, hmm, we need to find a potential three door path, right? Is that possible? It's not possible with the path we currently have open because even if we don't take that door there, we would end up here and we would certainly um, do more than four that way. So that can't be it. So let's try our other options just to be safe. We've already exhausted this route. So what happens instead if we were to go this route and gain access to this pathway? This, and we follow this um, that we've, you know, opened the doors. We can't go to the right because that would just be redundant with a place we could get to right from the starting point without opening any doors. But if we go to the left, We'll end up on our other route again, and again, our fastest pathway would be this, which is four. Which is interesting, because it makes me think that there must be a three if there are two separate four-door pathways. And in fact, there are, because... No, there aren't. that's actually not true. <laughs> um, let's see here. There is actually a three-door pathway. I'm trying to think... How can I get to the you know, same spots on the map and just in fewer moves? And I believe that if I were to go through this door here, I could very quickly then follow all the way to the left. So from the start down here through that door, go all the way to the left, past the dragon, past the skull, not go through any of those doors, those doors, and then go to this one, and then come all the way down. And that would be a three door path. And if there is another three door path, then then there neither of them is the fewest, right? Um, so there would have to be a two door path. And do I see a two door path? Absolutely not. <laughs> and there's no way there's a, a two door path. No, just following back from the goal towards the start line, if you go those two different routes that have the doors, you're going to run into two doors so quickly <laughs> that um, there's no way it's, those are the options. So yeah, I think I think this is it. It reminds me of that one water flowing through the pipes puzzle. Awesome, we got it. Nicely done. This situation was dicey, but it looks like our brave knight has triumphed again. Well, our brave knight hasn't necessarily triumphed from that first fearsome foe. So we'll we'll see. But anyways, lion versus cheetah. Okay, interesting puzzle name. Curious to see what the puzzle itself actually entails. A cheetah and a lion square off in a 200 yard race. The first one to run 100 yards, turn around, and run back to the start line wins. The cheetah leaps 3 yards in one jump, whereas the lion only leaps 2 yards with each bound. To make up for his lack of speed, the lion jumps 3 times for every 2 jumps the cheetah makes. Assume their paces stay consistent the whole race. Who will win this race? Gotcha. Um, so let's think about this, right? The, the cheetahs with the, in terms of the distance, um, well, first of all, there's a, you know, 50-50 shot. So we really got to make sure we're good on this one because if we guess wrong, we're immediately going to know the answer. Um, I think the thing that's tricky here is, right, if you look at this in terms of just rates and distance, 
Uh, the cheetah is 50%, you know, three halves, right? That ratio to the lion, whereas the lion's rate is three halves to that of the cheetah. And so you would think they would cancel out. But it, given that it's 100 yards, the cheetah is actually going to end up jumping past the 100 yards and instead jump to 102 yards because you can only jump three at a time. And so the nearest multiple of three to 100 is 99. And so then we'll jump to 102 yards and travel that extra distance while the lion will actually land exactly on 100 yards and then turn around. So in total, the cheetah is actually going to be traveling 204 yards, right? Whereas the lion is going to be traveling um, 200 yards. So I think that's the I think that's the trick here, because otherwise. Otherwise, I think their their rates and distances are meant to cancel out per se. I think that's the trick: is that the the distance is in the lion's favor. So we're gonna go with the lion then, which is a shame because um, cheetahs are actually one of my favorite animals. I'd actually say my favorite animal. Now that I think about it. I think I've got it. All right, we got it. Professor, I've solved it. The speed of the two animals is equal, but the lion reaches the exact halfway of the point in, of the race in 50 jumps. The cheetah's final jump, on the other hand, goes two yards over the halfway point. This means that when the cheetah turns around to finish the second leg of the race, it'll have to run 102 yards instead of 100 yards. This cheetah will run a total of four yards more than necessary. Strange as it may seem, this race goes to the lion. Which, is, again, is a shame because cheetahs are really cool. Yeah, cheetahs are probably my favorite animal, followed by... Elephants and penguins. Giraffes are up there. I like tigers, too. <laughs> Not sure if there's much of a theme. But it's been that way ever since I was a kid. Alright, silence is golden. What do we have here? An infamous antiques thief breaks into a museum looking for a prized gold medallion. In the vault, there's a case with five different items on it. On it. Oh, okay, I see. The, the thief knows that the medallion is carefully hidden inside one of the items. Above the case, there is an inscription on the wall that reads, Silence is golden, three is the magic number. The thief only has time to steal one item from the case. Which one should he take? So we're looking for a gold medallion, and we're given the clue, Silence is golden, three is the magic number. Silence is golden, three is the magic number. Hmm. And the five items we have are a bomb, a pair of scissors, a... a bust of a horse head? Maybe like a knight chest piece? And then a sword and an hourglass. Silence is golden. Three is the magic number. Both of those must be necessary, right? It's not like a, oh, you might get this one or this other clue that'll lead you to it. It's, it's they both gotta be together. Only the first word of each is capitalized as to be expected. So capitalization isn't gonna be a trick in this inscription. Um, is, I can think of a sound that's associated with all of these things. So maybe that's not... Maybe that's not the right way to think about it. What about three is the magic number? I'm trying to think, you know, is there something amongst these that has a three in it, right? I think, you know, an hourglass could maybe be perceived as there's three seconds left or three, something like that. Um, three is the magic number. Maybe a bomb countdown from like three, <laughs> two, one, I don't know. Uh, the, the sword, I don't know. Hmm. 
Silence is gold and three is the magic number. Can I move the items? No, but I can draw. For whatever reason in this one, but I can't draw in some of the other ones. <laughs> Still pretty funny. Um, hmm. I mean, I would think that the hourglass is the most silent of all those things when I consider the sound effects associated with them. Uh, there are three of, like, pillars in the hourglass, right? Silence is golden, three is the magic number. I mean, notably the sword and the, the knight piece both have gold visible on them. Is there some rearrangement I need to do of that clue? Silence is golden, three is the magic number. Not sure I'm gonna I'm gonna think on this one for a bit guys but if I have anything any new thought process or something that comes to mind I'll be sure to let you guys know so initially I was thinking about <clears throat> the items themselves right what would silence is golden refer to what would three is the magic number refer to but I think that if that were the case if that were the right thought process you would only need one of those clues in order to actually get it which, which may be the case, but I think it's actually likely that you need both pieces. You need both clues in order to get it, right? And it's also kind of odd, the clues they give. And so what I'm starting to transition to is the thought process of how can I manipulate this statement? Silence is golden, three is the magic number. Whether that's eliminating all of the silent letters, of which there are only two, <laughs> Um, or do I eliminate the third letter from every word, for example? Or do I make a new word out of the third letter, um, or every third letter in the statement? Is that the case? I haven't found anything useful yet, but that's kind of where my thought process is at, at the moment. I guess one other thing you could consider is... Each of those statements individually, silence is golden, and then three is the magic number, could reduce the number of the objects, right? So, for example, silence is golden might get you down to the chess piece, the knight piece, and the hourglass. As, you know, the bomb is something that's loud. The scissors snip audibly. The sword, I don't know, clanks with other swords, or when you set it down. Um, and so maybe the most silent would be those two objects. And then three is the magic number would tell you which of those two objects it would actually be. So, so maybe that's where my brain should be at. By that thought process, I would think the hourglass, but honestly, I'm far from confident in that. So I'm still probably gonna think about it. Actually, maybe it's worthwhile to get a hint at this point. I've thought about it for a good, maybe 15, 20 minutes now, and and I think that I don't see myself coming up with much more. Think about how each item is different, and then think about how that could relate to the inscription. <laughs> well, duh, these hints, these hints on these weekly puzzles, guys, have been near useless, <laughs> if I'm honest. They've been pretty unhelpful. Uh, so think about how each item is different, and then think about how that could relate to the inscription. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Really riveting advice there, game. Yeah. I mean, for what it's worth, how helpful is that? It tells me that I shouldn't be trying to decipher some sort of code within this statement, right? I shouldn't be eliminating every third letter or, or something like that. I should actually be focusing on the objects. In that sense, it's helpful. But it doesn't tell me much to do beyond that. So I think actually I might go with Hourglass then. Because... It's the most silent, and it has three of those columns in it, which is honestly all I can really think of at this point. So let's let's give it a go. 
I am I am okay with with doing that for now. I don't see myself coming up with much different anytime soon. It's not that. I've let you down, Professor. Nope, it looks like our thief is going home empty-handed tonight. Oh, they're not even gonna give me a little little tip. Okay, well it's not the hourglass, so. So whatever I was thinking before is not correct, right? So how instead could I differentiate these, right? Silence is golden. Three is the magic number. So I guess one other thing that is coming to mind now is that sort of relating the silence is golden, three is the magic number. You could maybe interpret that as something related to three, there's going to be silence of whatever the item is, right? Um, and for me, that kind of resonates with the scissors. Right now, you can think of it as sort of a, a three-legged or three-appendaged shape, where, where each loop at the top is one appendage, and then the combined scissor blades at the bottom are um, one appendage. And when you open them, they become four, uh, but then of course they will they'll make noise so they're silent when they're closed it's pretty it's a stretch honestly i don't feel confident in it but but again i don't really think i'll be seeing much more i guess one other thing i can think of is the hair on the knight vaguely forms a three like that That's the only thing I can think of. Honestly, maybe that's a better bet than the other one. Silence is golden. It has a gold piece. Three is the magic number. You can kind of make a three with its hair. Sure, let's go with it. How does this sound? Wow, so that was it. Legend's Apprentice saves the day! <laughs> And I got it for totally the wrong reason. Brilliant. The answer is night, because it's the only item to contain three silent letters. That thief's on easy street now. Wow. So, I wasn't... I should have known. I should have known. I was thinking in a somewhat right direction at first, with silent letters and such, but not applying them to the right thing. Okay, that's clever. I'll, I'll give it to... I'll give it to the puzzle. I, I think that's actually pretty interesting. I think the only thing that could have been improved is to make sure that the, the the player knows that this is a knight piece, a chess piece. Otherwise, it could just be, you know, like the bust of a horse or something like that. Or if somebody's unfamiliar with chess, they might not know that it's called a, a knight and instead might say it's called the horse and would never get this puzzle as a result. So, um, but otherwise, very, very cool puzzle. When you, when things work out for the completely wrong reason, gotta gotta love it. Okay, special order is up next. What do we have going on here? Interesting. Below is the scene of a man ordering a particular item at a fancy restaurant. What in the world is this man trying to order here? Look at the picture below before you take a guess. H I J K L M N O. So. Eight consecutive letters of the alphabet. That's pretty odd. <laughs> the below is the scene of a man ordering a particular item at a fancy restaurant. What in the world is this man trying to order here? Look at the picture below. I don't see much else in the picture itself. All I can think of is, this hint is essentially eight consecutive letters, right? I don't think this is supposed to be like a, we need to rearrange the letters to come up with something. We'll, we'll think about that, for sure. But I don't think anything comes to mind immediately. It would have to be a pretty interesting word, given we only have two vowels to work with, and we have some pretty odd consonants, right? J, K... Hmm... Y... 
Yeah, I don't think that's... Gonna do it. So the only thing that comes to mind is then, are there eight consecutive letters in the alphabet elsewhere that make the the name of some food that would be ordered at a fancy restaurant? Um, I'll just pull up a list of the letters of the alphabet. That's going to be easier to actually cipher through. I would think that, you know, <laughs> I would have already recognized if there was some random food that spelled itself in the alphabet, but that's not, yeah, there's no way um, that's the case. Yeah, so if that's not the case, maybe we are doing an anagram of some sort. Maybe we do need to rearrange these letters. So maybe it's not one word then, right? Maybe it's two words. So what comes to mind, can I draw? I can. So I see milk in there. And so if we cross those guys out, what are we left with? H, J, N, and O. John? Milk John? <laughs> John Milk? <laughs> I don't... I don't know. Uh, I don't think there's anything else I can think of. J definitely can't be the last letter. Uh, and I don't see how it could be anything else, so... Alright, so option number one is John Milk. <laughs> Lovely. Um, or Milk John, of course. What else could we what else could we get? Maybe loin. Sorry about the clicking, but it's just easier this way. We can't do that because then we wouldn't have any vowels left. All right. So, if that's the case, we need to come up with two words, each of them only using one of the vowels. Hmm, so let's focus on I first. What could we come up with with the word with the letter I in the middle somewhere? Just milk is all the only thing that's coming to mind now. Uh Gin? But I, this is what, rated E game? <laughs> There's no way they're gonna reference Jin in this. And it's not even technically how you spell it, I don't think. I don't, I don't drink, so I don't actually know. <laughs> uh, milk. Yeah, that's, that's all that's coming to mind. Let's think about O then. Are there any words that come to mind for O? I'm not really coming up with much. The only thing now I'm thinking of is how would you pronounce each of these, right? And when you say these letters, does it sound like some sort of an order? H-I-J-K-L-M-N-O. H-I-J-K-L-M-N-O. H-I. H-I-J. Hmm. H-I-J-K. K-L-M. Hmm. Not, not having a lot of luck here. Maybe we're we supposed to account for the fact that this man doesn't have teeth? Is that relevant? I also don't think it can be like some something that's way out there, right? It can't be some fancy French word or something like that that the average player they can't rely on actually, you know, knowing, right? So it's got to be accessible to you.
I mean, milk is the only thing I can think of <laughs> that you can just get from those letters. Let's let's use a hint and see if it's helpful at all. Focus on the old man's speech bubble. The letters H through O are lined up in a row. Your answer should be five letters long. So the only thing helpful here is that they say to focus on the speech bubble, so we don't need to care about his teeth or whatever, but your answer should be five letters long is helpful. Focus on the letters H through O. Really? Wouldn't have guessed with all of them up here. <laughs> Anyways, if it's only supposed to be five letters, and there are eight letters there, hmm, would it be like, it couldn't be every other. Should we be able to figure out that the answer has to be five letters? Or is it just, it's a five letter word within this eight letter pile, right? Because if so, how could we differentiate that, that answer from milk? Maybe it's important that it's a fancy restaurant? Like, like we're dealing with, I don't know, limon, <laughs> L-I-M-O-N. I don't know if that's like French or Spanish for, for lemon or something, but <laughs> that would be pretty funny, wouldn't it? I'm basically, now I'm just trying to think of what are some five letter words I can even make with these letters, and I'm not coming up with much. Alright, so I've been looking at this for quite some time, and I cannot, for the life of me, come up with a reasonable five letter word here. Um, the only other thing I'm thinking of is, maybe he's not trying to order something and is instead trying to say something. So like, I, John. <laughs> as like some sort of introduction or no no gin right um like i mentioned before but i'm not really even confident that that makes a lot of sense either with anything that would be a three letter word that doesn't involve n or o right and Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's what I'm gonna go with for now. Is just I John and hope for the best, or maybe, I don't know, maybe it's like no him or something. But yeah, we'll, we'll we'll just go with I John, and we'll see how it goes. Um, at this point, yes, I have enjoyed the weekly puzzles, but I'm not looking to spend a lot. A lot of time just thinking about this type of puzzle where I can't really work my way through it. I've let you down, Professor. Give it some more thought. Look at the letters lined up on screen. They start with H and end with O. How else could you describe this lineup? They start with H and end with O. How else could you describe this lineup? How else could you describe this lineup? Alphabetical order? So it seems like it's more about what type of order these letters are more than actually descrambling them. So I guess my thought process was what could he be ordering, right? And initially I was thinking making an order at a restaurant, right? So maybe it's like an alphabetical order, a letter order, a word order, an ascending order, and seeing if one of those fit in that context. But now I'm thinking it might be not ordering in terms of, you know, getting a menu, getting an item off a menu, but instead sorting, right? So you could ask yourself, what is this man sorting in his speech bubble? And that's kind of what I'm experimenting with now, right? Is it letters, words, speech? I'm trying to come up with something that'll be five letters, but I don't really know yet. But that's that's what I'm gonna be thinking about for a bit. I'm trying to think of like, what this guy could be seeing at the restaurant, right? Is it a name tag? Is it a menu? Is it an item? Is it 
the bill, the check, whatever it is that he is trying to order, as in sort, right? And I'm still not coming up with anything five letters. Like, I think maybe lunch? But, but I don't feel confident about that. It's a particular item at a fancy restaurant. And when you order it, as in sort, you end up with H-I-J-K-L-M-N-O. Maybe if you, like, rearrange those letters, they would make something like John L. Kim, like a name? But even then, that's not a five-letter word, right? The answer is five letters. It's not name tag. It's not waiter. Not waitress. Not reservation. It's not host or hostess. Maybe diner? No. Yeah, I don't know guys, but it's been it's been a long time that I've been thinking about this and I was hoping to get through all these puzzles in this episode and due to editing it's probably not been that long for you guys, but it is it has been a long time for me in this episode. And I'm getting pretty ready to call it, so I'll think on this a little bit more, but for the time being, yeah, we'll we'll try and solve the puzzle later. There's still two more. Morning Greetings and Bright Idea. I think I may call it for the night, in terms of my recording, just because I'm, I'm feeling pretty ready to be done. I'll think on the image equation, I'll think on a fearsome foe, I'll think on this special order. We still have a couple more left, so I'll probably... I wish I knew how long this episode actually was so far. I'll probably just have a second recording session where I look at these. Or maybe... Oh, maybe I should just look at them briefly now. <laughs> maybe I should. I kind of want to. Because if they're going to be quick... If they're going to be quick, they're going to be quick. Let's see here. Puzzle number 25. Morning greetings. At the edge of town, there is a traditional private school with 10 boys, 10 girls, and a single teacher. The school requires students to show proper respect to the teacher and other students by greeting the teacher and other students with one bow. How many bow bows could you expect to see on a given morning? So, the, the key here is that the 10 boys and the 10 girls are going to have to bow to each other, right? Um, and that's going to... Well, we're going to have to consider that they're pairs, right? So I think it'll be... Well, we'll get to that in a second. Um, the easy thing is, all of the boys and girls are going to have to bow to the teacher, right? So that's... I should start writing this down. Um, that's 20 bows, right? Yeah. Um, although... Actually, no, never mind. So, yeah, we've got 20 bows for the teacher from each student. And now we consider each of the students, right? So, one student... Let's go with the, the boy. Um, one boy is going to do 19 bows, right, for every other boy and girl. Um, <laughs> and then the next boy, the second boy that we go to, is going to do 18 bows, right, for every other boy and girl except for the first boy. And then the third boy is going to go and is going to do 17 bows, right, because it's going to be for every boy and girl except for the first two boys and then the fourth is going to be 16 and then the uh the fifth will be 15 and the sixth will be 14 and and so on until we get to the 19th student uh the 19th the ninth girl in this case who would have one bow left and then the 20th student the 10th girl who would have already bowed to everyone so essentially what we have is the sum of all the numbers from 1 to 20. And I should actually know this formula off the top of my head. I think it's, uh, it should be the average of the first and last term times 
the number of terms over two, I think. <laughs> um, but that wouldn't actually make sense in this setting. Uh, I guess, I mean, just what would make sense is the average of the terms. That's what it is. Um, it's not the sum. It's the sum of the, the two numbers divided by two, right? So the average times the number of terms, right? So it'll be 20 times the average, um, which in this case would be 10 or 10.5 actually, right? 20 plus one divided by two. And what will that give us? That will give us 210. Yeah, I think so. 210 bows in total. There are 20 bows from each of the, the boys and girls to the teacher. And then we consider all of the boys and all of the girls. And I, I think the process I went through that is sufficient. So I think that's 210. Let's give it a go. Can't believe I forgot that <laughs> that simple series uh, formula. That's not it. Great. I'm so embarrassed. Think again, including the teacher and students, there are a total of 21 people on campus. Stay sharp, though, because you've probably overlooked something important when forming your answer. What a lovely, what a helpful hint. Um, let's let's think about this. Did I do the math wrong here? You know what? Maybe this is a bit of a word problem here. <laughs> I'm thinking, how could I interpret this otherwise, right? So the school requires students to show proper respect to the teacher and other students by greeting the teacher and other students with one bow. Does that mean one student shows up and bows to all of the other students and the teacher once? Or does that mean individually bowing to each student and the teacher once? I assumed it was going to be the latter. And that's what got me to the math that I did in the first place. Um, so, so if it is the former, and instead this is a little bit of wordplay, right? Where each student is showing up and bowing once when they get there. Well, each student is going to bow once. I guess um, the teacher's not going to bow, right? Well, that was accounted for in my previous one. Or is the teacher going to bow? Because that would add an extra 20. I don't know. The school requires students to show proper respect to the teacher and other students by greeting the teacher and other students with one bow. It makes it sound like the, the students are bowing, but not necessarily the teacher. I wish that point were clearer. <laughs> if, I, if I could know whether or not the teacher is actually going to be bowing. So, do we want to try that other interpretation, right? Where we assume maybe it's some wordplay going on here. And each student shows up and bows once to everyone. Maybe that's what we should be going for. I really wish I knew if the teacher was bowing or, bowing or not. Because that makes a huge difference. They I use did. the term the student bowing, which makes me think that might be correct, but... You down, professor. Yep. Oh boy. I wanted this to just be a quick one, but here we are, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew if the teacher bowed or not. The school requires students to show proper respect to the teacher and other students by greeting the teacher and other students with one bow. It makes me 
but I, I've always assumed that when one person bows, the other is going to be bowing back to them, right? So, so maybe I should add an extra 20, right? In my initial calculation, I just had the numbers, you know, 20 through 1 being added together, and that initial 20 was because each boy and each girl was going to bow to the teacher. But if the teacher is also bowing to the boys and girls when they do that, that's going to add an extra 20 for the teacher there. Actually, wait. <laughs> wait, no, the, the way I initially calculated that, I think accounted for, let's see. So the boys and girls show up, they bow to the teacher once. So each boy bows with the teacher. So the teacher is gonna bow to 20 people. And then, Each student will bow with 19. So I think I awkwardly calculated this the same way, actually, accounting for the teacher bowing. Because you have the teacher bowing to 20 students, and then one student is bowing to the 19 remaining students, and then the next student is bowing to the remaining 18 students, and so forth until you have, you know, the final student who's already bowed to everyone, right? Do I include zero in the series then? I think that might be the mistake I made. Is that it's technically a series that goes from, that starts with the first term of zero and goes all the way to 20, not one to 20. The sum should be the same though, actually. Yeah, it'll be the same. So that doesn't make a difference, which intuitively makes sense. So it's not 210 and it's not 20. So maybe my next guess would then be 21, right? Where everybody shows up and they all bow to each other once in the beginning. And thus there are 21 bows. That's assuming the teacher bows to the students. So we'll give that a go and see if it works. If not, we'll probably try a hint. I've let you down, Professor. Oh boy. Probably overlooked something important. That's not incredibly direct directive. Hmm. Yeah, we'll we'll take a look at the hint. See what it has to say. Did my game freeze? There we go. Each student bows to the teacher and every other student, including the teacher and the students. There are a total of 21 people on campus. You may think that information is enough to go on, but make sure you've read the puzzle over carefully before you answer. This is not a helpful hint at all. <laughs> the hints on these weekly puzzles have been so bad. <laughs> so unhelpful. Is it maybe another wordplay thing where they say, how many bows could you expect to see on a given morning? And the wordplay there is, you're not actually there, so you aren't going to see any bows, right? There are only the 10 boys, only the 10 girls, and the one teacher in this private school, right? So you're not even there, and thus you would see zero bows. Maybe that's, maybe that's the wordplay answer they want to go for. So let's, let's try that and see if that's what they were aiming for. Well, here's my guess. Nope, that's not it either. Oh, I was sure I had it. It's gonna be another one where I, I end up more frustrated than I am happy with what the solution is. 
I feel like it's always wordplay that comes down to, well, I, I think I got the math right, but there's something I must be missing about how I'm interpreting the structure of the problem. And so now I'm kind of playing the guessing game of what wordplay can be interpreted in a different manner, you know, in the manner the puzzle creator intends. I guess I was making the assumption that when one person bows to the other, that person would bow as well and and would count as their bow of greeting them for the morning, but maybe that's not the case and maybe they would, you know, take turns initiating the bows and then we wouldn't have to worry about overlap and instead we would have just every single person doing 20 bows for every other person and that would give us 420 but I don't really like that yeah I'm not a big fan of that hmm yeah I feel like I'm at a point where I may just be getting more frustrated with the problem because I'm not really clear on what wordplay they want me to get here and I feel like it's more of a guessing game than actual actually trying to deduce what's going on so we'll we'll try the last remaining puzzle and maybe then I'll just say all right well let's look up the solutions and see how I feel about them <laughs> because at this point, it would almost be silly to have another episode that has just, you know, one one little puzzle solution and then me looking at the solutions for three remaining ones. Anyways, puzzle number 26, bright idea. Stark in here, turn the light bulb on by fixing the wires that connect it to the battery. Rearrange the panels so that both wires continue unbroken from the battery to the light bulb. This looks pretty cool. So, let's start with some just initial guesswork based on sort of the shapes here. Wow, so some of this looks like a real mess, <laughs> to be honest. But I think, um, so that's not gonna work. Interesting, but these pieces seem to line up actually quite well, right? Which makes me think that, well, this still could actually be there, but it makes me think that this is gonna go here and instead this will go over here and however that means that cannot go there I can't rotate the pieces can I oh actually no I, I should be using every piece at least once so that's good to know um, what else is good to know this piece lines up well with that one interesting actually so the pieces line up well with certain other pieces uh, just based on the locations of the wires but they they line up well at least on some sides more than once um, which is definitely worth noting so the question then is going to be how can we make it work best and whatever it is at the top we're going to have to have it such that it connects the two wires like that and I think this may actually be our solution So I kind of just intuited that from looking at how the different sides were connecting, but I do think there's some interesting methodology that could be applied here, right? Where you look at the different sides of each piece and say, how many leads does it have? Because that limits how many other pieces it could be connected to. And so you try connecting it to a couple different tiles and see which place of the grid does it need to be in so that it can expand as needed to connect to these other pieces. But all that to say, I think we got this one. Well, here's my guess. All right. Professor, I've solved it. Oh, good. This room could use some light. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. So there were four puzzles that I was still thinking on. Do I want to think on them some more and come back another time? Special order... Morning greetings, image equation, 
I'm not entirely convinced I'll see anything more <laughs> if I think about him again than I would another time. But maybe in the interest of just giving him a fair chance, I guess. I'll come back to this at another time, and we'll go over the solutions if I don't come up with anything more interesting uh, tomorrow. Because, well, ugh, man, <laughs> I, I kind of just want to conclude it, though. I, I really enjoy solving the puzzles myself, but... But I'm at a point in all of these puzzles where I don't really see a next step to take. Where I feel I've exhausted a lot of the logical leads I do have. So you know what, let's let's go over Let's go over the puzzles, let's look at the solutions and see how it works. So this is the Fearsome Foe one, right? And I was actually thinking about this one earlier, uh, when I was in the car a little bit too. But it was said that anyone who slew the beast was destined to spill his own blood in the process. Immediately, the, I, I was thinking of yourself. And that's what I was thinking, but I tried that and it wasn't correct. So, so what is the answer? Um, you two, or the hints, right, you two may have bested this foe in battle. Your answer should be eight letters long. Uh, let's see. Okay. So it looks like the answer is mosquito. So it was very literal, right? Um... I was thinking, like, at one point, you know, like, bacteria and malaria or whatever it may be. Uh, something that would involve, like, bloodletting or I don't even know. Um, that, or a vaccine where, where you'd have to donate blood or something like that. Mosquito is, is clever, but, again, this type of... This type of puzzle, you guys know, doesn't sit super well with me. Because you just kind of sit there guessing without really without really a lot to work with. <laughs> because there really wasn't, in my opinion, anything else in the question to really push you in that direction, was there? Like, do you know if it's even referring to, like, a beast, a monster, just some it. living creature, or is it more abstract, like yourself, right? Professor, I've solved it! So... Anyways, this bloodthirsty beast is none other than the dreaded mosquito. Squish one of these little guys while it's on your arm and you'll have your blood all over before you know it. Truly a fearsome, if somewhat annoying, opponent. Funny visual. I appreciate it. But, again, still not really my favorite puzzle. <laughs> um, let's move on to the next one. The image equation. So this one, I feel like I stared at it for a good 20 minutes. Um, just trying to figure out... Again, what are the similarities between the two? Is it to do with shapes that are shown in the images, or I don't know. Maybe it's um, maybe it's like the shape your hands make when using the objects. That's all I can really think of. Uh, but that really only accounts for like the X's, right? So I don't, I don't really know, and I'm not too convinced I'm willing to, to sit for another half hour to an hour <laughs> uh, to try to figure it out. Though here I am sitting, trying to think it out again. <laughs> Did we try the hint on this one? I think we did, right? Look at all the options again and try to figure out what they have in common. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna look this one up. Let's see here. I'm curious to see what the answer is. 
Um, the answer is... The answer is handcuff. So, in the top left we're seeing handshake. The top right is a handkerchief. And then in the lower left we have milkshake. And then in the lower right we have cuff links. Wow, there's there's no way I would have ever gotten that. <laughs> um, I cufflinks. Why would they show the two pictures then that show the the cufflinks as opposed to just like one that has the cufflinks, not one where it's like picking up something on the on the right hand side. On the top right, I thought that was a piece of paper, not a handkerchief. And the lower left, it could have been a milkshake, but I wasn't sure that that was the exact dessert they were using. So. You basically had to take the first, for the, all these compound words, or, you know, yeah, compound words, the first word in the compound is the symbol on the left, and the second word in the compound word is the symbol on the right. So in this case, what they wanted you to find is that circle means hand. And after you found the pattern that, oh, X means shake, then you would say, I know that the green triangle represents cuff when you identify cuff links and then circle triangle thus means hand cuff wow so i think that was um pretty obtuse <laughs> i i think the i the idea is in and of itself pretty clever but i don't think there's enough to work off of there really i'm sure somebody got it but I still don't think that really makes it a well-designed puzzle, in my opinion. Wow, I feel so bad just kind of Thank ending off this series of the weekly puzzles on a more pessimistic note, right? With the puzzles I didn't like, I wasn't able to get, but good job. As you guessed, the answer is handcuff. The key to this puzzle is that each option is a compound word that can be broken into two parts. Okay, so we've got a couple more. Special order. I think I'm just going to take a look at that one as well. I feel like I've exhausted a lot of what there is to consider about this puzzle, but let's see what our answer is here. The answer is water. Huh? Oh, I see. Okay. I see it. <laughs> um, I still don't really like it. <laughs> but, but hey, it's, uh, it's clever. There's no doubt about that. And the rationale is, the order is from H2O. It's H2O. And, you know, H subscript 2 or water, the chemical formula for water. Sound? That's Ladies interesting. Saves the, day. the answer is water. The puzzle shows the letters H through O listed in a row. You can also read this line of letters as H2O. Change the spelling of two and you have H2O, the chemical formula for water. Yeah. I like the image. <laughs> but I think there was... I think there was just way too much to get lost in in this puzzle to even think that it was how you would say, you know, the ordering from H2O. And that specific way of saying it needs to be translated into what, you know, the actual item is. And it also doesn't matter that it's at a fancy restaurant or a particular, you know, item, right? It's particularly fancy. So, again, I, I felt like that puzzle lacked direction, again, even though it had a clever basis. All right, let's see what's going on with morning greetings. The final, final touch. Morning greetings, Leighton. What do we have here? Shout out to the Leighton Wiki <laughs> for for providing some uh, some great stuff going on. Let's see what it says. All students in school have to bow, but the teacher doesn't. So, so that's pretty important. If you remember that, you get the following results. So the teacher doesn't have to bow which means it would actually be 19, right? All the way through. Um, 
Wait, what? So... What do they... Alright, so the answer they got is 400, I think. So, notably, the teacher doesn't have to bow. I didn't know that, nor do I think that's particularly clear. Um, but let's see what explanation they give for why the answer is 400. I guess mutual bowing is not a thing. <laughs> so, there's no doubt about that. I guess... Yeah, so I guess if you think about it in terms of if mutual bowing is not a thing. So this student needs to bow to another student. Um, and then, and then, well, I guess they would both bow in that instance. And then the other student would need to bow to that original student and they would both bow again. So we don't need to worry about overlap. And I said that that would lead to 420, right? But if you consider the teacher doesn't bow, then you would subtract the 20 bows the teacher would have given to all of the students and that could get you to 400 but let's see what they have to say there are 20 children and one teacher the teacher doesn't bow to the students there are 380 bows between students and 20 bows to the teacher how do they get 380 all the students in school have to bow but the teacher doesn't if you remember that you get the following results the boys bow to each other 90 times Yeah, I don't like this. This is singular bowing, right? So, well, 90 is what you would get from doing what? 9 plus 9, yeah. So, <laughs> actually, would you get the average for that? No, you wouldn't. The boys bow to each other 90 times. So, one boy would bow to the other 9, and then... The next boy would bow to the other nine, and then the next boy would bow to the other nine, etc. But in each of those bows, it must not be mutual bowing. And then the girls would repeat the process, and that would be 180. And then the girls bow to the boys, and the boys bow to the girls a total of 200 times. Because... They would be, each of them would bowing to 10 of the opposite as opposed to nine of their, their same gender cohort. And then the bowing 20 times to the teacher would get you up to 400. So I, I can see the image they're painting in, in this puzzle, but I'm trying to reconcile that with the math. Right? Because I feel like it should still work then if... Like, I feel like I should still get the same answer. If you consider... Because they, they basically just counted all the bows, sort of like we did, right? Where you start with one student who is then going to bow to the 19 others. I guess, yeah, the, one of the big things was, the big thing was they allow for overlap, right? Odd. I guess something I should note is that if they were overlapping, or I guess, oh man, wow, I'm having a really tough time explaining myself. Sorry guys, it's late. Uh, if one student bows to 19 others, I shouldn't have counted that as 19 bows if I was assuming that both students involved would bow. So that's how I ended up with such a low number comparatively. That was actually a mathematical mistake there. Um, in each of those bows, each of those 19 bows, if I was going to progressively move along and say, oh, now the next student wouldn't, we're not going to consider that bow to the first student because they've already bowed. If I needed, if I wanted to proceed in that manner, I needed to count each student's bowing with another student twice to account for, well, the second student bowing to the, the original student. So 
I would actually need to double my my sum from 20 through 1, which would lead to 420. So I did do the math actually conceptually incorrectly there. I think the only... And then you have to consider, does the teacher bow or not? If the teacher bows with the students, then it's 420. If the um, teacher does not bow with the students, then it's 400. Yeah, so I think that's what it comes down to. Um, I wish it was more clear whether or not the, the teacher bowed. I, I kind of wish they specified that in the problem. But otherwise, the math itself is pretty cool. And um, I think that's, that's the only complaint I really have about this problem. It's a lot of bowing, though. <laughs> it's a lot of bowing, guys. But it's something. So there you have it, the weekly puzzles. Overall, I'm glad I got the chance to do some more Professor Layton puzzles. Uh, Layton is a great series, and I really enjoy the characters, and I, I think I really enjoyed, you know, working through the large mystery at hand in the, in the Curious Village. And I don't think this set of puzzles was representative of the quality of the main game's puzzles, to be honest. There were some really neat ones, I think. Uh, the nose-to-nose -nose one was particularly cool. What else was there? Blayton's hat box was pretty neat. The clock's chime, I think, was actually blatantly wrong. Some of them were clever little things like, you know, the vanishing tower, or um, the, the enigma was actually really cool to... Chicks and hens, I like that type of puzzle, so that was pretty neat. The jersey numbers was clever, even though I got it wrong for the re <laughs> or got it right for the wrong reason. I didn't consider the repeating digits, which is kind of silly. Find the volume, I actually liked quite a bit. I think, given you could take that more algebraic route like I did, or you could just sort of use spatial reasoning to reconfigure the cube itself, that was pretty cool. Uh, the lion versus cheetah one, I thought was was fairly clever, and. Yeah, so I think overall I, I liked them, and I'm glad I had the chance to do them for sure. But there were quite a few that I think just, you really had to guess about what the puzzle maker was thinking when they made this puzzle. There's not really a lot to deduce to a certain extent, or there wasn't quite enough direction uh, to really, I don't know, make a meaningful approach to the problem. And then, of course, the hints were horrible. <laughs> the hints were so useless for many of them, and there's only one of them, which wasn't very helpful. So, overall, uh, still a big fan of Layton and the Curious Village, and definitely feeling Diabolical Box in the future. We'll see how soon that'll be. Big thank you again to Mario X Mega. Please tell me it's Mario X Mega. I think that's the name. <laughs> Uh, for helping out with actually getting me access to these weekly puzzles because without without their help I would not have been able to do that so thank you so much for not only making the suggestion but making accessing these puzzles possible and it's really cool to see that there are people actively trying to preserve this experience within this game uh, because it was only available during 2008 apparently so so very cool, and I guess this actually marks the official end of the Let's Play now. Even though I thought the last bonus episode was the final one, I guess this is actually it. So thank you all so much for watching, even especially those of you that, despite the Let's Play finishing a long time ago, uh, stuck around to check out these weekly puzzles. I very much appreciate it. But until the next episode of whatever it is of mine you decide to watch, this is Movie Night Zero, and this mission is complete.